fully committed, absolutely flat out in qualifying for this year. Fully committed, absolutely flat out in qualifying through here, fifth gear almost in the limit tower. La source, the bus stop, Blanchiment, Eau Rouge. These iconic corner names are not only playing host to the world's biggest GT race this weekend, the Total Energy's 24 Hours of Spa, but also round three of the 2021 Fanatec Esports GT Pro Series, which reaches its halfway point right here at Spa Francorchamps in Belgium. 24 stars of this weekend's twice around the clock enduro must first compete virtually for real world Fanatec GT World Challenge powered by AWS Teams Championship points on a set of Corsa Competizione. After Monza and Paul Ricard, it's now Spa's turn to host the Fanatec Arena, which has been unpacked and built up in just two days, thanks to AK Informatica, right here in the center of the paddock. And the two previous 60 minute encounters have been epically dramatic. A victory and a class podium thanks to Arthur Rougier has helped Emil Frey to four teams championship points. Whilst victory last time out for team WRT and Kelvin van der Linde has given these guys an extra three teams championship points. Virtual racing ace Danny Yukudela has yet to score a victory in the Fanatec Arena, but thanks to two second places for Aka ASP, he lies equal top at the head of the standings with four points. We have two separate races within each 60-minute encounter, one for the pros and the other for the silver teams, and that is being led by Rinaldi Racing, thanks to Nicola Veroni's full haul of points back in France. Rio Chiu Tomita collected maximum points for WRT Silver Team in Italy. And Paris Compact's double podium has contributed three more points to Mad Panda's real world team score. So the question is can any more teams get themselves some real world championship points from our virtual race? Well, before we find out, Let's have a tour of this magnificent Spa Frangorchamps circuit, my very favourite, both in the real and in the virtual world, with Matt Campbell. Matt's driving one of the coolest liveried cars out there, uh, the GPX Martini Racing Porsche. And uh, Matt, you're a bit of a sim racing fan at home as well as here, right? Yeah, absolutely love it. You know, getting online with your mates, uh, having some fun, and but also doing a little bit of practice. You know, preparing for the real world and uh, you know it's fairly enjoyable and try and fit it in as much as possible. 
Spa is one of my favourite circuits, so let's have a quick look and see what it's like for you. One of your favourites as well? Yeah, for sure, up there. Definitely in the top ten, that's for sure. It's a very <laughs> famous track, but uh, coming up to La Source and uh, one of the most important parts of the track, I think, because obviously on a good day, a rouge is flat and uh, it's all uphill run, so uh, very important to get a good exit out of, out of La Source and up for a rouge. And instantly you'll see as we switch between the two cameras, gear changing in exactly the same place, curbs exactly the same place. You really have transferred your skills from the real world into the sim and vice versa. Yeah, very much so. I mean, the, the techniques and, and the way you attack the corners are exactly the same. The lines, the way you use the curbs. So uh, the realism in this fact is uh, very, very accurate. OK, coming up to the more technical part of the lap, coming off the older section of the lap and onto the newer, but built in 1985, so not really that new at all. Uh, and lots of curb munching. Exactly, and it's just about flow, you know, trying to think ahead for the following corner and uh, connect the dots, basically, because, uh, you know, it's just so important to flow the car well and, and not overpower one corner, and then you're obviously ruining the exit for the next. I find this bit a bit tricky because you've got different lines through Bruxelles and then Speaker's Corner is a bit of a funny one as well going downhill. Yeah, exactly, and there's a big bump in the middle and also very easy to go wide and get track limit, which obviously we don't want. You know, we don't want to get any laps deleted, So, uh, and it's also the same in the sim. Pouan or Double Gauche, depending on which uh, era you're from, a tricky corner? Uh, it can be, definitely condition related. You know, it can be very tricky, especially in the mid corner when you get to on power, because obviously you're carrying a lot of speed in. Uh, into this, uh, the Fanier Chicane, and again, a place where you ultimately you want to get over those curbs, right? Yeah, exactly, and especially depending on condition, you know, you really have to use the curb to be able to help rotate the car and turn it to, to do what you want. So uh, I think in the race there'll be a lot of dust flying in, in certain parts. I'm noticing that uh, your real world car is a bit leery at times. Yeah, I think we've, luckily we've made it a little bit better compared to uh, where we started in practice when this was in practice one, but uh, yeah, a little bit oversteer. And uh, I think we'll see a little bit the same in the sim today too. All right, coming up to the, the fastest part of the lap, but really somewhere where you brace yourself through Blanchemont. Do you do that in the sim as well? Uh, I mean, a little bit, depending on how <laughs> loose the car is, for sure. But uh, Blanchemont flat out, and you know, now coming up to the, to the last chicane. Make a little mistake here on my, uh, my good lap on the left-hand side in the real world. But uh, yeah, very tricky last chicane, you know, making sure that you don't run too deep and then obviously get a good exit out of the last corner. And the blast of the line, and look at the time, 0 0.02. That's insane, Matt. Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely impressive. I mean, uh, you know, it's obviously quite hard in the real world to do such fast lap time, but also on the sim, it's, uh, it's quite difficult as well. I can't wait to see you guys racing this. Head off to your sim. I'm going to head to the commentary box. Thanks very much. Here at Spa Francochon, getting ourselves ready for a 60 minute encounter, including that mandatory stop and we will soon get a chance to at least get the rolling up lap underway and a chance then to look at the grid for this particular race. Last time out, we had victory uh, in the pro category for Kelvin van der Linde, uh, and therefore he carries himself 30 kilos in his Audi. His teammate uh, Tomita carried weight uh, in the last round, but this time uh, after not getting in the top three, uh, has a lighter Audi in the silver category. Victory in the silver category last time out went to Rinaldi Racing's Nicola Verone. Verone has been replaced here by Fabrizio Cristani. So we've got quite a few different drivers participating uh, this, week, uh, this event. And <laughs> it was that waving. I think that was uh, Arthur Rougier at the, uh, not waving, yawning. They are all, uh, I think, practicing right now. I'm not sure if they're on the rolling up lap. They are on the rolling up lap. Uh, so we'll soon get a chance to see them uh, around the circuit. There's a good look at what the drivers are seeing on this rolling up lap. You can see that there's a radar in the center of the screen, and that tells the driver exactly how far away he needs to be to the car in front. This is over the shoulder of Arthur Rougier, who is our joint championship leader after two rounds. We've got a full arena of uh, team personnel who are on Discord channels to drivers as well to tell them in terms of strategy what to do. And some very interested fans and sponsors, of course. We welcome Fanatec and uh, the boss, Thomas Yakimaya, to our stadium once more. And uh, boss of SRO, Stefan Rattel, an eager viewer this weekend as well. A weekend full of action on track. An absolutely rammed schedule in the real world and also in the arena 
an opportunity if you are coming to the circuit perhaps to get your chance to get your hands on one of these Fanatec wheels and feel exactly what this setup is like worth around 12,000 euros per rig with the Fanatec DD2 literally the best uh, direct drive wheel that you can get and the pedals as well giving the drivers real field feedback the kind of feedback they would be expecting when they jump back into their real world cars some of them this evening for our Super Pole session to set the top 20 for the 24 hours of Spa which kicks off uh, at 4.30 local time tomorrow. It's a pretty quiet day for most of our drivers and let's have a look at the grid then. We have a BMW on the pole position for the first time. David Pittard way after the checkered flag had flown taking the pole position by just 0 0.030 of a second over Arthur Rouge in the Lamborghini. Martin Dents alongside him and then Matt Campbell who we heard from just a little bit earlier on incredible lap time that uh, that we saw on the split screen to, to basically equal what he did in the real world Danny Yucatelli yet to take a victory a very accomplished virtual racer and he'll be looking in his Mercedes to get right up their fifth position start Galbiati in sixth then Cristani new to this not a bad effort from the Italian to get himself seventh position on the grid in the Ferrari, best of the Ferraris, and the Rinaldi Ferraris already picked up decent points with different drivers on each event so far. A different strategy for Rinaldi Racing. Fontana had some points last time out in his Lamborghini. He starts H. Tamita in the first of the Audis down in ninth, and then Nicholas Nielsen in tenth spot. Druet 11th, Calvin van der Linde, our winner last time out, only 12th spot in the heavy Audi. Louis Pret, we've seen racing. Uh, in our virtual online series but this is the first time we see him uh, in the arena and then it's born the Jonte Ben Barnacoat 16th compact 17th work to do for him Laverne in 18th Marshall 19th Kiergaard in 20th Stolz Cairoli Mapelli and Philip Ellis the 24 runners who are getting themselves ready to go racing here at Spa Frankelshawn heading themselves towards the start and finishing line a rolling start they all need to make sure they're in the right boxes and Dave, uh, David Pittard's got a good advantage right now over Rouge, who's really holding back here. Trying to get that run up as the lights are going to turn to green. It's a very long hold. And I'm not sure we are racing. Of course, we're going to wait until we go down to the endurance line before we actually go racing. So the drivers getting themselves formed up now, but we won't get that green flag until we head down towards Eau Rouge for the first time. Formation looks good. Tomita just a little bit to the right-hand side in his WRT Audi. Looking for some clear air, I think, with uh, Cristani just ahead of him. Remember, we've got two races, the silver and then the pros. Four pros in the top five. Martin Dent in the silver car. And now we go racing, and it's been a good start from Arthur Rougier. He's made the jump on uh, David Pittard, and Pittard slots into second position. Side by side for third, and somebody going very, very sideways further back in one of the Lamborghinis. But this is the battle for third position between Dent and Campbell. Campbell to the outside, Dent to the inside, and David Pittard in the BMW with good legs on uh, his car to the outside line of Rougier, but that's not going to work on this first lap, and he slots into second position. We've got Mercedes and Martin Dents in third, and then Matt Campbell in fourth position. Danny Yucadella seems to have held on in fifth spot, and it's, for the most part, at the front of the field been pretty clean. I think that car we saw going side, uh, side on through Eau Rouge was Alex Fontana, who has dropped to the tail of the field behind Marco Mapelli. Mapelli in that car for the first time, uh, replacing Portolotti, who will do the Super Pole this evening, and didn't want to be distracted from his Super Pole um, duties. Therefore, uh, we see Mapelli, who hasn't really had a chance to practice too much in the 63, so he's down in 23rd position. Battle on for third position. Down to the head of Campbell, who really wants to get a wiggle on in that Porsche, that wonderful livery, the Martini livery. And I'm pleased to say, legging it down from the commentary box in the real world into the virtual is David Addison with me. But what we do have is very definitely a real fight going on, don't we, now for second and third and fourth. David Pittard in the BMW just ahead of Marvin Deanst, who in turn is trying to get rid of Matt Campbell, who is just about hanging on in there. Fifth is Danny Junkadea, sixth kicker Galbiati. But this is all playing into Arthur Rougier's hands because he's building the gap band, isn't he? 
That second half of that first lap not being good for David Pittard. He's dropped back. He was challenging Rouget into the first turn. Nicholas Nilsson looks to have lost a position to Cristani, and we've lost Louis Pret as well, who's dropped down to 23rd position. So a problem for Pret on this first lap. And there's a change, but he's too deep into the chicane. And oh, oh. unnecessary contact. So that was Marvin Deans getting it all wrong. There's a car off in the background. One of the Lamborghinis, David Pittard, delayed in all of that as well. And so at the end of the lap, Rougier leads Pittard with Campbell in third place. And there is more strife coming out of the chicane. Fourth is Junkadea. Fifth is Dean. Sixth is Crestani. Nicholas Nielsen, seventh. Calvin van der Linde, uh, who won, of course, last time out at Paul Ricard. He is eighth. Cairoli is ninth. And tenth is Nicholas Bourne. And he, too, is looking for places. Uh, Compact was one of those cars off in the background, so he's dropped down the 21st position. He's had points in both of our rounds so far, uh, but he will be disappointed in the Mercedes to be uh, well out of the points right now. And more of them running way, way wide, coming out of Radion on that time. So uh, you've got Matt Campbell going after David Pittard, but Arthur Rougier, the man that won the opening race, remember, back at Monza, again showing his sim ability because he's building that gap. What's he got? Two seconds in hand over David Pittard. This is the best that we've seen of David all season because he's going really well here. Yeah, absolutely. Qualified on pole position uh, on a last lap scrabble. He was in second, but managed to find two tenths of a second just uh, into the chicane alone to grab that pole position. A lot more association between David Pittard and BMW Motorsport Sim Racing. The two of them helping each other. Uh, Nils Nelyok uh, helping David with the setup of the car uh, and David then having to adjust to Nils's advice, uh, which is a bit <laughs> alien to, to David's driving style. But Niels Nalyox knows what he's doing, doesn't he, in sim racing terms. So there, the battle is on for second place. Matt Campbell right round the outside of David Pittard. He gets run up the kerb. The BMW is ahead, but the Porsche has the inside line into the pith path. Break as late as you dare. Porsche takes the place. Good move. Yeah, Porsche looks very, very settled, doesn't it, uh, in the onboard lap that we saw with Matt Campbell before we went racing. That car looks really, really good. And Matt, a, a really seasoned pro in terms of sim racing, but not necessarily on this platform. And he's getting his, uh, I think the break between the last two races has really allowed him to get his teeth into this and work hard with the Porsche engineers. They have an association with a team called Coanda, who have done a lot more work on a set of course of competition after the last few months of, uh, before that, they would never really raced in it, but uh, they have world champion Josh Rogers, who now knows what this is like. He's been working with Matt Campbell, and that is paying dividends. Matt's study of concentration then, as now he hunts down off a Rougier for the race lead, but he's going to try and find three seconds. As further back, DTM race winner Philip Ellis has got Thomas Drouet and Ezekiel Perez compact for company. So the Mercedes train here comes down towards the chicane, 14th, 15th and 16th. And Philip Ellis doing a good job for the moment of hanging onto position as best he can. Up towards the line they come, over the timing line, another lap in the book. But up front, Matt Campbell has taken the 10th out of Rougier's advantage. That's not bad for Philip Ellis, who started on the back row of the grid. It didn't look like he even managed to get a lap time in, whether he binned it and damaged the car or whether he had other issues. But uh, on the back row of the grid, up to 14th in just five minutes. That's Whoa. very good, but that's not good for Martin Dent. Around goes Marvin Deans then, he was fourth heading up the hill and he ain't there anymore, is he? So that means everybody else has to scatter. There's still a yellow flag up there, he's trying to get himself going, but he is dropping like a stone as Pittard is back onto the tail of Matt Campbell. So this means that Matt's got to go defensive, he will go slower, he will have to defend, he will lose time against Rougier, and the fight is on for second place and it plays into the hands of the leader. Nicholas Nielsen into the pits as well, so he's had an issue somewhere, uh, and it really is a dramatic and frenetic start to this 60-minute encounter. Remember, we've got a pit stop as well, so you can remove yourself uh, out of a potential battle, but that only happens at a certain point in the race. A window in the middle of the race is when you can pit, and that window won't open for another 20 minutes or so. Uh, which of the rounds we've had thus far have not had a frenetic start because we had it at Monza, Paul Ricard was all dramatic as well and yes again you're absolutely right it's giving us great racing. Matteo Cairoli under attack here from uh, Raichira Tomita who had a real world spin at Radio yesterday but he's having a virtual battle with the Porsche right now. This is the sixth. Yeah and WRT working really hard they've got a virtual engineer that comes in and helps both Kelvin van der Linde and Tomita get the best out of their cars. Uh, they work together on the three hours that the drivers are allowed to practice in the Fanatec arena. They're only allowed three hours in their sims at each venue that we're racing at. This is the third venue that we've been at. There is Tomita concentrating very, very hard. Great to see the full face because, of course, with the masks that we've had before and with the racing driver proper attire, helmet and balaclavas, you rarely get to see the expressions on the face. He's chilled, right? He is. 
and he's busy as well because he is absolutely crawling all over the back of that Porsche. The dynamic motorsport car of Mattia Cairoli right here goes to the outside line coming into the chicane. Uses a lot of kerb there on the way in and in the mid part and a place change further back as well because that is Danny Junkadea getting up past Dennis Marshall. So Danny Junkadea trying to move his way forward now as they come up towards the line. Ben Barnicoat running behind them in the Jota McLaren 10th. Yes, yeah, so Danny started in fifth position, so something happened to him in the early laps to drop him uh, down to the outskirts of the top ten. Barnico didn't qualify very well at all. Uh, we've seen good results from him or good performance in parts of races, but he's never got that McLaren to a point where he's got decent positions. And side by side, into Row Rouge, he rarely works. Oh, Matteo Cairoli hangs on to the advantage. Everybody took a sharp intake of breath there, and he comes out ahead. That was brave, brave stuff. And not only that, but now, look, uh, Matteo Cairoli is up with, alongside, and as he passed, Kelvin van der Linde. Kelvin van der Linde, very slow up Eau Rouge. I don't know whether he had a little issue and had to get out the throttle. If you have an issue in Eau Rouge, it compromises you all the way to this point of the track because you're carrying a lack of momentum. And I wonder whether that car's got an issue as he goes through Le Com. He doesn't seem that fast either. No, because he's lost the time, lost the place, can't find back. Uh, Marvin Deans and Nicholas Nielsen, we've lost into the pits, incidentally, but at the moment, Tomita is looking as though he's going to get up past Kelvin van der Linde as well. So Kelvin is trying to make the best out of this, but Matteo Cairoli, there you can see, having gained the place, is pulling away. Next target for Matteo Cairoli will be Fabrizio Crestani's uh, uh, Ferrari, I should say, number 33, the Rinaldi car further up the road. Now, how about this battle? Kelvin van der Linde suddenly has found the pace again. Wow, easy, easy move. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, unnecessary contact there, and that's put uh, Tomita, who just about held onto the car for a moment, but unfortunately into the barriers. Big lose, big impact, and that, I fear, is the end of Audi number 31. Matteo Cairoli, having suddenly lost time, lost the pace to Kelvin van der Linde, and then had to get all defensive, didn't he? And it did not work. Good moment to mention the penalty system that we've got here. We do have automatic penalties coming from the computer which uh, does track limits and things like this the game recognizes if you've got an advantage over uh, by running wide at any point but then we've got real world uh, stewards in the same area as we are right here from the virtual from real world into the virtual world and they'll be looking at all those instances to make sure everything is fair Cairoli on the attack again then, whoops, more contact against van der Linde and there's another battle going on lower down as Fabian Laverne tries to gain, a gra uh, gain ground lower down. Cairoli is still battling with van der Linde but he's back ahead of him as they come up then over the line. Fifth is the Porsche, sixth is the Audi and Danny Juncadea with a second and a third to his name is almost with them and again van der Linde gets up the inside line. This could end in tears yet. We are not over with this fight. Van der Linde is on the inside as they head down the hill. Cairoli's got the grunt in a straight line. The Porsche retakes the place. Yeah, but now Kelvin van der Linde's got the slipstream all the way up. Eau Rouge over Radion has a little bit of a swapper on, but keeps it straight enough and now should be able to pick up some kind of a slipstream. The Audi's not good up there at all. Look, he's, been, he's now being swallowed up by the Mercedes behind. I ran up quicker than that the other day. <laughs> to the outside line goes Danny Juncadea. So that's two places that Kelvin van der Linde has lost. But can he get them back through the twiddly bits down the hill? Let's see. Van der Linde then, winner at Paul Ricard, and he's down in seventh now, coming out of Le Camp. But Juncadea is on the attack, isn't he? Lead gap, by the way. Rougier to Campbell, still 3.6 seconds. It's always a weird one trying to set your car up here because the middle sector of the lap requires a car that switches um, direction very easily and, and is a nimble machine, but then you want the high speed down Blanchiment and through a Rouge and up the Camel Straight and it's two very separate cars that you need to really get the maximum out of this track. If you set your car up for the middle sector and go fast there, you can't overtake in the middle sector and then you're, you're compromised for the rest of the lap. Cairoli deep through Paul, so it goes a little bit wide. So Danny Juncadea now is looking the stronger of the three. Actually on this lap, Van der Linde has not been able to make up that lost time. He's still with them, but he's not attacking them as they sweep now uh, through the Piff Path. That's the first element now from the left. And Juncadea, you bet against at your peril right now. Plenty of time left. These guys have been absolutely at it like it's a 20 minute race. It's actually a one hour encounter with a pit stop, and we've only had 11 minutes. Kelvin van der Limbe with a 15 second penalty. I fear that might be due to contact somewhere, not quite sure where, but uh, an interesting penalty that usually uh, I haven't seen him run wide anywhere. So let's turn our attention to, uh, to the real world stewards. Is that, uh, is that from them or is that from the computer? 
They are still deliberating. There's a lot to look at, I think, going on in this race with not only track limits, but also with uh, contact as well. Danny Junkadea, though, is working his way through the order. Wasn't a mega qualifying, but there he is now up through some of the traffic onto the back of the Porsche that just wags its tail. And look, Cairoli really does go defensive. That puts Danny Junkadea almost onto the grass, but he's staying on the inside line. Up to La Source now, last of the late breakers. Mercedes on the inside, Porsche on the outside. Junkadea gets the job done, but he goes wide. And back through comes Cairoli. You just can't defend this hard for, for the next 48 minutes. Cairoli's going to be knackered if he does. He'll be useless for the rest of the weekend. There is Danny Ugadella, who is, uh, again, very relaxed. We've seen him practicing across the weekend, and he just seems so calm, uh, getting a little bit of help from the Mercedes guys. But ultimately, he knows best uh, in that kind of organization how to get the best out of these cars. Yeah, he's an excellent sim racer, isn't he? And as I say, two podiums. He's been perhaps the most consistent. You also factor in, though, of course, that they carry uh, extra weight because of the top three results in both classes, in the pro and the silver coming into this race. Cairoli defending for the moment, but he can't do anything about shaking off Junker there. It's almost when rather than if the Mercedes goes through. Further back, here comes Dennis Marshall being attacked, and that's Tomita going back through. So Tomita will be carrying some damage uh, from that contact with the wall. We may not be able to see it visually, but he will feel it. And the car will certainly, especially on the straight line, not be as fast uh, as it once was. And that's why Marshall is crawling all over the back of him in the twiddly staff through Bruxelles here. A bit tricky to find an opening, and probably the WRT car will feel better here. But when he gets onto the fast stuff, when he gets his foot down and tries to get maximum velocity, that's where the car doesn't feel as fast because of the damage. Having got all excited about Philip Ellis earlier on, I'm afraid the uh, Anglo-German Swiss driver is into the pits as well. So we've lost two Mercedes and a Ferrari. Dennis Marshall goes through in the uh, Audi number 66, still pressing on as well, trying to gain places back. But with 46 minutes still to go, it's been a very lively start to the race, that is for sure. Arthur Rougier, who has had one win already within the series, he's 3.6 seconds to the good. So he was able to make that break, wasn't he? Right at the very start as the battles raged on around him. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, first couple of corners, it looked like Pittard was going to try and disrupt his rhythm. Pittard didn't manage to get past when he needed to. And now there is Arthur Rougier, who's been such a force, so strong in this competition so far. Uh, in Sometimes a car that ne necessarily the most favoured machine, the Lamborghini, if you were a, a pure out sim racer, you wouldn't choose necessarily the Lamborghini, but we have a bespoke BOP. Um, by the organisers that have tried to balance these cars as best as possible, trying not to give an advantage to any of our different brands. Uh, and Arthur Rougeau, therefore, able, thanks to the work that Emil Frey is doing as well, his practice at home, again, in a comfortable lead, 3.5 seconds ahead of Campbell. And Campbell, equal to Pittard right now. As if you haven't got enough to worry about with a 24-hour race, with qualifying, with night practice and everything else, you've also got to do all this practice for the esports elements of the competition now. It does show how seriously the drivers, the teams are taking it and how, how much importance, how much increased importance esports virtual racing now has. Of course, there are points for the teams in the two classes, three, two and one for the top three, and a big, big lose there. The Audi off in the background, that was Dennis Marshall, and damage has been picked up going through Radion. So uh, Tomita escaped. He'd also, of course, been involved in a skirmish earlier on and that gets him out of harm's way for the moment. He's on his own now for that 13th place. Now we saw Alex Fontana sideways up Eau Rouge on the first lap, but he's got himself back up into the top 10. He's second in class, crucially. So uh, look at the grey and the white numbers as two separate races here. Cristani for Rinaldi. They've got a new driver in each of the rounds, Rinaldi, and yet they still are picking up decent points. Fontana second in that class, drew a third. I don't think we need to worry too much because he's in the pits, but Marvin Deans, if he goes back out, will get a drive-through penalty uh, after his dramas earlier on, but I'll mention that just for the point of history. Calvin van der Linde's 15-second penalty still shown on the timing tower, and there, Alex Fontana then in ninth spot, the second of the Emil Frey Lamborghini. His house is if your Paris Compact's Mad Panda Mercedes doing. He's in 11th place, but coming under attack, isn't he? Nicholas Bourne is there behind him, and that gap is diminishing all the time. He's picked up uh, points in both of our races so far, but he had an issue at the start of the race. Now he's only fourth in that Silver Cup, so that Panda could be picking up a couple more points if anything dramatic uh, happens ahead. And in fact, uh, he's third because Thomas Dreyer is behind him now, so he is picking up a single point. Yeah, so Compact presses on and chips away, chips away. Third in the class then, so doing a good job third in Silvers as the Mad Panda Motorsport Mercedes uh, booms up towards us. Ben Barnico, drive-through penalty. Oh, dear. Don't know whether that's uh, Stewart's decision. I think that's a Stewart's decision as well. 
uh, and in fact goes straight into the pits to take it uh, so he can give his, his time, as much time to get back onto the tail of the rest of the field as possible. But that's a shame for Ben Barnico. He's the, the only man flying the McLaren flag and sometimes that McLaren is very, very strong. There's lots of very good McLaren drivers in the virtual world as well. McLaren Shadow uh, is kind of the works team with James Baldwin running in the virtual European Championship that we've got running online for virtual races. Uh, I don't know whether Ben and uh, James have hooked up yet, but uh, I'm sure they know each other because James used to do a lot of uh, karting as well before he went into virtual racing, then got back into the real world with British GT. And then back into virtual racing, <laughs> yeah, and yeah, yeah. on it goes. Uh, now this is the car to watch for second place now. Matt Campbell, the gap has widened, hasn't it? It's gone up to 3.9 seconds, so the uh, Porsche with the pseudo martini colours from GPX Racing, looking a bit grimy and grubby around the gills, comes through with David Pittard in third place. So the quick brick based in Germany these days, rides wide out of speaker's corner over the kerb, down toward the port. Now the Porsche is getting away, but equally is not doing anything about that leading Lamborghini. No, no, exactly. And Rouget really has the pace here once again. Uh, Lamborghini have a really strong uh, eSports, well, they had a championship actually. They ran their own championship on this platform to find the very best Lamborghini drivers in the world. Uh, and so they have a really strong support network that can help Arthur Rouge if need be, much like Ferrari. They have their Ferrari Driver Academy, which is also young drivers in single seaters in the real world and has about five or six virtual races as well. Now this is the fourth place Rinaldi Ferrari, Fabrizio Crestani, very experienced real world Ferrari campaigner and delivering the goods here, isn't he? And what we now need to see is whether he's got a chance of doing anything about David Pittard because his last lap was fractionally slower, but can that Ferrari come good late race against the big booming BMW? Rougier, Campbell, Pittard, the top three still. He doesn't need to, he doesn't need to push because he's in a separate race of his own. Of course, every racer wants to get as many positions up the overall leaderboard as possible, but he has those three championship points. He has the big checks and cash prizes that we award at the end of the race as well. And therefore, and this is also his first time racing for Rinaldi uh, in our pro series. Uh, and so I think uh, he would be w wise just to chill. Now, we're not that far away from thinking about pit stops, are we? So let's just get the homework out of the way while it goes quiet for a couple of corners. What's the window? What time do they have to do? What can they do? What do they need to do in the pit stops? Uh, so, middle point of the race, the window will open for 10 minutes, I reckon, from uh, 35 to 25, uh, and or 25 to 35, depending on which way you're looking at it. Yes. Uh, and uh, they just need to do a single litre of fuel into the car. They don't need to change tyres, and then they can head back out onto the race. And I don't think we're worrying too much about fuel usage for, say, the Mercedes that are quite thirsty, that perhaps in other circuits we would do. You can do more work if you want, but you just lose time, don't yeah. you? So it's, it's kind of self-defeating. Uh, we had one or two people, I think, in an earlier race try and do something clever on pit stops, but it hasn't necessarily been the best idea. So what you've got now, you've got to try and run to the end with. Kelvin van der Linde with that 15-second penalty, though, is the one that's really going to suffer at the end of the race. Yeah, so he can take that penalty when he goes into the pits. He doesn't, it's not a drive-through, so he doesn't need to take it separately to his pit stop. He will be basically stationary for 15 seconds more uh, than a standard pit stop, which is just literally 15 seconds dropped. For him, for the points, it's going to be difficult for him to recover and get uh, into the top three because the top three so strong today in the Pro Cup. Uh, a disappointment really for WRT because both him and Tamita are uh, outside the points paying positions right now. David Pittard hard at work in that third place. One of the few with his mask on as he concentrates on what's going on. And of course that Porsche having got up past him has got away, but David still looking for a podium. And it shows, doesn't it, how the experience is kicking in, how now working with Niels Naujok is kicking in because he's had a 10th and a 7th and here he is looking for a 3rd. When he turned up to the first race uh, that we had, which was in uh, Monza. Monza, it was Monza, yeah. Uh, he had never set foot on the platform before. Uh, he had done a bit of sim racing, but he'd never driven on ACC uh, and competed in that very first race and wasn't that far off. Uh, and over the last couple of months, obviously working with BMW Motorsport that have a very strong backing of four different teams uh, in the world of esports racing uh, and a really strong desire to be better and, and show their hand. And that is playing dividends with both Pittard's dedication to this, but also BMW's help for him. Indeed so, as a little bit further down, van der Linde again just showing how that Audi seems to be struggling. And don't forget, it's the best of the Audis as well, way, way back in seventh and losing pace all the while. It's being reeled in now by Alex Fontana's Lamborghini. So as they come over the line, that gap is coming down and down and down. And this is Fontana hard at work. 
Yeah, and he really has worked hard because he was quite far back after his first lap spin. Uh, he's up to second position. It was him that we saw yawning at the start of the race. Uh, so he's certainly woken himself up now, thankfully. Uh, and looking for two championship points as well. So Emil Frey, as a team generally, both in pro and silver, doing really well uh, out of this virtual racing. Absolutely right. So as there you've got Alex Fontana hustling on. He's almost now within striking distance of the Audi ahead. Ben Barnicote, I don't think, has gone back out after that drive through. He stayed in the pit lane. So that's a big disappointment for Ben, who was showing good pace again in the McLaren into Le Camp goes Fontana look he's half the gap now that uh, Audi is carrying 30 kilos and uh, when you speak to some of the ACC kind of pro drivers they do say that weight and tire pressure and uh, tire temperature are far more sensitive in this platform than perhaps in the real world so maybe that 30 kilos is feeling like 90 kilos because uh, of the way that the, the simulation simulates the weight uh, and it really is punishing him on that drag all the way up Eau Rouge, all the way. You're going still uphill until you get to Le Camp. Oh. More drama, more contact, more damage. Dennis Marshall was involved in all of that, I fear, and he's off the road. It never ends the drama in this race, does it? More yellow flags fly, and at least some of the drivers can smile about the, the demise of others, but it's a shame that, again, we've got contact. There's no need for it. No. Uh, there really is no need for it, but it, because there's not that... Uh, that worry about paying for damage, that worry about the safety of your life. Sometimes the, uh, the drivers come into this with a, a laissez-faire attitude uh, and we do end up with a bit more contact than you perhaps would see uh, in the real world. So right now, Arthur Rougier leads, nine laps done. He's got a three and a half second cushion over Matt Campbell. There's David Pittard third. Fabrizio Crestani is fourth. Matteo Cairoli fifth. Danny Juncadere is uh, sixth. Seventh is this fight. Calvin van der Linde just ahead of Alex Fontana, who even if he can't find a way past van der Linde on the track, will take the place on the pit stops because of this penalty to be applied to the Audi. Yeah, exactly. And that window will be opening in just a couple of minutes' time. So he probably would be wise not to send it too hard and just to be a bit more patient. He will have connection with the Emil Frey team. He'll be watching what you're watching right now and be able to tell him exactly what's happening. Fontana probably will also see on his screen that Kelvin van der Linde has a 15-second penalty. So he'll know that too and he'll know to be wise. So at the end of this lap, the pit window is going to be open, so some drivers might choose to bail early, get it out of the way. And as the field plunges through Eau Rouge once more, up rally on up the other side, race leader is still Arthur Rougier, that gap just creeping up. But again, another one of these very fleet of foot Lamborghinis, that of Alex Fontana, is about to gain seventh place. Makes the move early on the outside line, but here he comes. So much more momentum, wasn't there? going through Eau Rouge and Radio and actually the Audi getting a little Whoa. bit closer. Oh, there's contact between the two of them, completely unnecessary. Fontana came across him. He thought he had a clear, uh, clear track and he did not. And that's eliminated two of them. Well, Fontana gets going again. Kelvin van der Linde, oh, what a difference a, a round makes. Winner at Ricard in dominant fashion, really struggling here. And that has now given the mad panda Mercedes the opportunity to go through on the inside line and take seventh place away. So the happy panda it is now, rather than a mad one, it is up two spots, Ezequiel Perez Compact storming up the order. And that means two championship points for him because Fontana was occupying second in the Silver Cup and he may even drop behind Thomas Druen now uh, uh, because of that contact. He'll certainly have a lot of uh, damage to the car, he'll feel a lot of damage in that Lamborghini and completely unnecessary, such a shame. So now, Kelvin van der Linde is being chased by Nicholas Bourne. Fontana, by the look of it, has got more damage because he's given up two more places there as the Emil Frey car limps to the pit lane. But Nicholas Bourne here looks as though he has got the pace to find a way up past the Audi. Kelvin van der Linde comes under attack then as they head now through the right of campus. Bit of a twitch from the Audi. And it's looking all rather inevitable, isn't it, that that Mercedes of Nicholas Bourne is going to go through. I'm quicker, Kelvin, he says. Let me buy. It's a kind of Bourne ultimatum. Pit lane window is open then. You've got 10 minutes to get everybody into the pits and back out again. And for somebody like Fontana, I think he will want to get that uh, damage repaired anyway. Fabian Levin, drive through penalty down in 14th place. Calvin van der Linde under attack. Nicholas Bourne is looking for a way through. He can't do it coming into the chicane. And van der Linde brings this Audi that's had a pretty torrid first 26 minutes to the pit lane. Oh, he's going to have 15 seconds to do for the penalty and then I'm sure he will want to get the car repaired so at least it feels good for the rest of the race uh, and uh, then at least he'll get some pace back. Question, can you repair damage while you're sitting there for your 15 second penalty? Do they have to be two separate yeah, elements? It has to be two, two separate elements, that'd be too easy, wouldn't it? <laughs> uh, so Caroli's pitted as well and that's the first man we should see 
with a green mark against his name to say he's completed the pit stop. That should simply be a quick one. But of course, the pit lane's so long here that actually the pit itself is a very long process. So Rougier, three and a half seconds to Campbell. That means it's come down a little over the last couple of laps, only by tenths, but it's a bit more optimism that Matt Campbell can hang on to. David Pittard, two seconds back in that third place. Fabrizio Cristani, fourth. And of course, remember, he is the uh, leader of his class. So the Rinaldi Ferrari, still looking very strong indeed in silver. And the pit lane is getting busier and busier. Many of those cars, I don't think, are going to rejoin, but there's a, a goodly number now serving the regulation pit stop. So here's Matteo Caroli in the pits. This is quite a long stop for him. Now he drops off the jacks. Maybe he's done a little bit more than something. Now he slots in behind Van der Linde. He'll be a very long stop, but that's just how long it takes to get a pit stop done here. Gets himself comfortable again and back out into circuit. Just like the real world, isn't it? Go down the pit lane, do what you need to do, tighten up your belts or adjust things within the cockpit. And now back onto the loud pedal as he comes up, Radion. Don't break the white line there, but demarks the circuit from the pit exit, and now you're away again. So that brings Matteo Cairoli back onto the circuit. What has he lost by choosing to pit? He's down in 12th, and Calvin van der Linde is back on track as well. I mean, he's miles away from the leader, 1 minute 35. Uh, but of course, everybody else will still have to pit. So Cairoli and van der Linde have cleared their pit stops. They've done what they need to do. Everybody else still yet to do so, although Fontana in the pits right now as Stoltz and Indy Donje. We've got uh, new drivers, uh, those two at Haupt Racing. They're brand new to our championship. Uh, uh, Haupt deciding to change their drivers from the last round as well. Yeah, cycling everybody through, seeing to a degree, I suppose, uh, what experience they can glean of uh, esports racing and maybe think about which is the, the faster for the very end of the season. As Tomita here comes through the chicane and although well, he's behind Nicholas Bourne, Bourne pits and that gives Tomita for the moment eighth place on the road. Oh, so. Rouge is so comfortable out in the lead of the race, isn't he? Doesn't have to push, doesn't have to warm, get his tyres overly warm, doesn't have to take too much risk. Remember how good he was at Monza, qualified really well, raced really well, lost the lead, gained the lead, lost the lead, regained the lead, but really, really feisty. Here, it's all fallen into his lap because battles behind a delayed people, but look at it, he's suddenly gone up now to a 4.4 second advantage. Barring a problem, looks like he's on target for win number two. And he's not a man that we've seen too much of in the virtual series. He's not one of these drivers that we see racing in the real world and then he jumps into a sim in, in midweek, you know, uh, like Danny Ucadella, like uh, Matt Campbell, like Max Verstappen did uh, to get over his Silverstone disappointment when he did a 24-hour spa race, uh, as you do. Uh, and, uh, but Arthur Rougier has been an absolute star when he's jumped into these Fanatec uh, rigs here in the arena. Cairoli's got to drive through then, so having just served that long stop, possibly sorting out some damage, now he's come up with a drive through next to his name. So Matteo Cairoli's day of woe persists. And it's again human induced, it's not a driving, uh, speeding through the pit lane or, or uh, getting across a white line or anything that the computer can recognise, it has come from our stewards. So it is from the stewards for reasons that we will glean hopefully in due course. But there is Matteo Cairoli running 12 on the road and Nicholas Bourne has served his pit stop. But none of that leading gaggle of Dan and Cairoli I think has just got the bad news. They're yeah. shaking his head. It's quite nice to see a bit of expression. So many of them are kind of just so concentrated there's no expression on their faces. But Cairoli's obviously been enjoying this and, uh, and you can see that he's... Uh, frustrated with that penalty, he'd have been informed by his team that are talking to him on his cans, on his radio, uh, and they can update him about strategy, when to pit, and also what's going on in the car. Now starting to slide around a bit, and if you start sliding too much, you overheat the tyres, and then the car gets really, really difficult to drive, but he's Ooh. drifting. Well, I think he possibly is of the opinion that the race result ain't going to go his way, so he might as well try and enjoy himself here. Nicholas Bourne, in the meantime, has pitted, so uh, he now can go to the end. And Nicholas Bourne is somebody else that we've uh, been seeing getting better and better in terms of pace during these races. Didn't finish at Ricard, but he got a 16th at Monza. I think that was Cairoli pulling off to the left-hand side and out of the race, deciding to retire out of this one rather than take the drive through penalty, knowing that perhaps he wouldn't be able to pick up points. You only get points and prizes for the top three, so... Really, if you're that much hamstrung, then there's no point. And in fact, there he is walking out the sim and he'll be heading back to the garage now, uh, out of the race and uh, talking to his team. And they're saying, yeah, no point. 
Also, go and get yourself ready for the warm-up that's coming up in a few hours' time for the real-world drivers. It might be that Matteo Cairoli has to think about Superpole as well as Tomita uh, comes through the pit lanes, plural, because you put the F1 and Endurance together. David Pittard still hustling on. Now, what's happened to Matt Campbell? A team made his pit stop he has. So Pittard then is second on the road for the moment. Matt Campbell falls out of second place by serving his mandatory stop. What we do know about the, the world of Niels Naujox is he... He maximizes how this BMW runs and he makes sure that the car has got a consistent pace all the way to the flag. What we know about these 60 minute races is that the Pirelli tyres that are simulated on here so incredibly well really get to their limit just at the end and they can fall off a cliff if you've asked them too much of them uh, in the early part of the race. BMW cars are set up not to do that, usually the Ferraris are as well and therefore perhaps that's where Pittard can make the difference later on in the race. What you're also noticing is that the Audis are really struggling for pace. I know that the car is just lapped and Dennis Marshall has made it stop and it was delayed early with an off, but the Audis just aren't at the races in the way they were at Paul Ricard. So David Pittard going after the Lamborghini. For the moment, he's got to make up 4.8 seconds, but that might shift late race. And uh, down the pit lane then comes the race leader. So Arthur Rougier comes in, David Pittard comes in as well. The top two down pit lane. There is David in our inset on the left-hand side, hitting the brakes hard. You can see the seat flexing because they're putting so much pressure uh, into the brake pedal as they would do in real life. These pedals are made to take something like six to eight newton meters of torque, uh, so they can really take a lot of uh, pressure and weight from the driver. And all these racing drivers used to absolutely stamping uh, on that brake pedal, and therefore the Fanatec kit has to cope with that. Right, so Arthur Rougier down the inside of La Source, ready to come down the pit road and rejoin the racetrack. The Emil Frey Lamborghini slowly, slowly, slowly makes its way down the pits. This should give Fabrizio Crestani the lead on the road, should it not? Because he's at proper pace staying out there. He's not yet pitted, nor is Kiko Galbiotti. He has now. Galbiati now pits. I was about to suggest that he was going to move up to second, but he has come in as well. So where will Matt Campbell be in relation to Rougier after the stop? That's the next question. I'm a little bit concerned about Rinaldi racing. They obviously have picked up decent points in the last races that we've got, but uh, Prestani's out there, he's not pitted, and the window shuts in less than two minutes' time. Uh, so there could potentially be a penalty coming their way uh, if they can't get into the pits within a minute and a half. Now, I don't know where Crestani is on the road, uh, but Matt Campbell comes across the start and finishing line of the Formula One pits and down towards Eau Rouge. There is Rougier, uh, who is making his way to the same part of the circuit. And I feel like Matt Campbell's going to jump here. Not sure, but it's going to be close because now the Lamborghini is up to pace. Campbell comes up Radion. He's all up the curb. He is going to just jump ahead. So Matt Campbell pitted earlier and he has done it. So what was a big 4.4 second gap, he's now managed to overcome that and take over the lead of the race. So Arthur Rougier's efforts seem to come to naught. Let's find out. And that was Pittard ahead of him. So Pittard is in our virtual lead ahead of Matt Campbell and Rougier's dropped out of the third position. Rouget's lost like six seconds in the pits there. It would have been an awful uh, pit stop for him. Maybe he took some fuel. Uh, don't know exactly what happened. Maybe he just didn't attack that uh, in lap. But Pittard for the BMW now leads. Porsche in second position. Two marks we've not seen yet take a victory. And great to see a big battle going on. Crestani, can he get into the pits within 28 seconds? That's the other question. It's possible, but it's also possible this could end in tears. David Pittard is making that the world's widest BMW. Matt Campbell is right there behind him. We'll keep an eye to Crestani in the pit stop. We'll keep an eye on this lead battle because they could not be closer. Matt Campbell hustling him along as they come then now down towards the pit path. They're both wide up the curb. There's no gap on the inside line there. David Pittard has covered that off really nicely. Campbell having to fight the car through the right, through the left he goes. And Matt Campbell, you can see how much work he's putting into this. He could not be nearer to the back of the BMW. He's almost in the car with David Pittard. I don't know how Pittard's going to cope with this for 25 minutes. It's going to be absolutely exhausting. He might just have to let him go and try and follow him and try and find a way past him later on in the race because this is huge pressure and it's going to slow the two of them up and allow the man that dominated the race so far, Arthur Rougier, to pass the both of them. So here they come, nose to tail. Rougier is certainly making up that lost ground. So it's going to be three for the lead in a very different second stint from what we had in the first, where Rougier was pulling away. So that pox pit stop has done for him. Down they come to the chicane and almost into the back of the BMW, Matt Campbell. Arthur Rougier is right there in third place. So any one of these three could win. And David Pittard now is really feeling the pressure. 
That BMW is big and it's even bigger now with Pittard sitting in the middle of the road. He's not taking any kind of a racing line through any of these corners around spa Frangachon. He is super, super defensive. And look, from Rouget being about a second and a half back, he's right on the tail of these three. He's a sitting duck, Pittard, surely going up the Kemil straight. But didn't you say something about the BMWs being made to run at a good pace right to the very end? Is he going to be able to stretch that advantage? Because Matt Campbell's working everything really hard by being there behind. He's working the tyres harder. Yes, David Pittard has to go defensive as well. Now, this is the part of the circuit where maybe the BMW can stretch its legs. Can David Pittard do anything about getting away by more than a half a length or so? The answer actually is no, because Matt Campbell's able to claw it all back under braking. Cristani did pit and it looks like he's come back out in the fourth position. We'll confirm that in a few moments' time. A big gap between Cristani and Jungadella for fourth and fifth. But crucially, Cristani for Rinaldi will be picking up three championship points for the Silver Cup. Uh, and he's well clear of Compaq in second and Drouet in third. Everyone has now completed the pit window apart from Louis Pret, who's uh, promoted himself up into sixth position, but unfortunately uh, will be disqualified. Uh, indeed so, because he's not pitted within the window. Right, this is the lead fight. Matt Campbell thinks about the inside line at Paul. He thinks about the outside line. He thinks about anywhere he can possibly go to get the lead away from the BMW. And Rougier is not quite with them yet. If anything were to happen, he wouldn't necessarily be close enough to take the opportunity, but equally, he wouldn't be close enough to get involved in any contact and Campbell again breaks ludicrously late there coming into the corner almost joins David Pittard in the BMW and that does now drag Rouget nearer to the Porsche yeah I think that was Pittard being cautious rather than the other two uh, being a bit too excited on the brake pedal and now the th really are locked to the three of them but that BMW looks very strong in a straight line amazing out of Eau Rouge to to be able to keep the advantage into the braking zone of Lecom and let's see what happens now into the braking zone of the bus stop because it's kind of a, a similar situation here basically flat out until you get to bus stop and there you can see the BMW stretches the margin a touch out of Blanchimont now up the curb and then you've got to settle the car you've got to get the line right for the chicane and again under braking Campbell does claw back some of the time and so does Rougier what Pittard needs is to try and stack the Porsche back into the Lamborghini they'll squabble and he can then escape yeah absolutely Mount Campbell's now got a bit more things to worry about because he's not just about attacking it is now about defending as well. He'll have his virtual wing mirrors on the left and right-hand side of his wraparound screen that he's got here. And he'll also have the radar that shows him where the cars are, if there's any overlap at all. So loads of data to know exactly what's going on around him. Perhaps too much data. Perhaps he just wants to focus on what's directly ahead of him. Uh, back in the old karting days, my dad used to say, never look behind you because it's, uh, you're asking for trouble. Uh, and that's, uh, that's exactly what Matt has to try and avoid right now. And that Lamborghini is just inching up, isn't it? So the Lamborghini we know has good aero. You can see off the shape that it's now cutting its way through the air like a dart, closing on the Porsche. And this is what David Pittard needs, a battle for second place to enable him to get away. And look, Rougier is right there now. That massive rear wing on the 911 uh, over the front of the Lamborghini. So it is Rougier now who led, dominated indeed, that first stint, looking for a way by. And all the rest of our runners out in the field, 15 left. Uh, this is the closest battle. There is no, no other battle, really, other than Fontana and Marshall. But Fontana still to serve a drive-through penalty. So he's not really in 13th place at all. We'll have to drop behind the two Audis behind him. And the top three is our best battle on track. And it is spellbinding. Still 20 minutes to go. 20 minutes for Pittard to absorb this pressure. Uh, particularly bad, uh, as we saw last time, into this braking zone coming into Fania. And this is where the Porsche and the Lamborghini really close up. And once again, they do. And the Porsche has to almost to get into the, get up off the racing line, not to collect the BMW. So that's where the BMW is at its weakest. And Matt Campbell will be clocking that and uh, working out that perhaps that's the place to attack in a few laps time. David Pittard only has to win by a thousandth of a second. As long as he wins, doesn't matter what the gap is. He would like a bit more of a gap, I suspect, for the comfort zone. But Rougier is the man that could save him from all of this if he can get up there and start giving Matt Campbell a bad, bad time of it. Into Blanchimont, they come again. This, you expect, is a part of the circuit that should favour the BMW. But good pit work, wasn't it, by David, by the Balkan Horse squad to get him up ahead of the Porsche, ahead of that Lamborghini. And Arthur Rougier will be furious about that as Campbell again closes up under braking. Contact avoided, but that three-car train, concertinas into the chicane. And this is what we like to see, three really proficient sim racers being fair with each other. We've seen it in other races as well. Some of the guys further back in the early running are a bit silly and we have silly contacts, but when we get to the crux of the racing, we've got the hardcore guys here respecting each other and providing us with great entertainment, as we like to see. 
So downhill, this is past the endurance pits, the heritage pits, the old pits where the old start and finish area used to be. Through a Rouge, we've got one car coming back out after a pit stop, which I think is Dennis Marshall after a drive through. Alex Fontana has just been given a 15 second penalty, but we're on board with the second placed Porsche. Sixth gear up the Camel Straight. Behind, you can just see it in the mirror, is the Lamborghini of Arthur Rougier, who's not really closing at that part of the circuit. Campbell closes a little towards the BMW, and then all of a sudden that Lamborghini has arrived in the mirrors. They're so much closer, aren't they, in the middle part of the lap? When it comes to the faster sections, they sort of go. Oh, and Matt Campbell's made a huge mistake! Off against the barrier, all over the grass, all over the kerb. Matt Campbell continues, but how much damage has that done? You can see him at work, but Arthur Rougier has gone up and passed him, and that car is clearly hampered. And that was Matt on the inset as well. You saw the frown come across his face as the car swapped sides and eventually uh, basically straightened up thanks to the barrier, so he'll be carrying that damage now. He's only lost one position, such is the difference between himself and Cristani in fourth position, and he doesn't need to worry about him. So Campbell's still on course for a one championship point, but it has rather now change the dynamic of this battle now it's just two cars against each other and they just defend an attack and they don't have to have that worry of the third car and about losing two positions rather than one so rougier has in a sense by default got second place what can he do about pittard what can he do that campbell couldn't can he get close enough to make a proper move can he force a mistake out of the bmw driver who now finds himself in traffic doesn't he because that's calvin van der linder up the road the man that won the last round so dominantly at paul ricard I know he had a longer pit stop because of the penalty, but he's now one lap down. Oh, he got awkwardly caught as well, didn't he? Just at the apex of Blanchemont. I didn't think that slowed them down too much. Pittard and Rougier clear of van der Linder. And van der Linder also a man who does a proper virtual racing uh, for a proper team. He's actually signed to Redline Racing. So uh, he has his works commitments in the real world with Audi Sport, but then his works commitments in the virtual world uh, with Redline Racing. And uh, amazing to see so many organizations, whether it be virtual organizations or whether it be real world organizations, getting involved in virtual. And every time we come to a race meeting in this Fanatec arena, more and more big sponsors, big manufacturers are getting involved. Louis Pratt still going, as you say, in six, but he's not uh, done the mandatory pit stop here. So something has gone awry for the Santa Lock squad in that car and uh, that strategy. Uh, the communication has broken down. Nine tenths of a second is the margin between Pittard in the lead, Rougier second. So bear in mind that Arthur has already had a win this year. So uh, we've had wins for uh, Audi and Lamborghini. Could we have our first BMW victory? Well, David Pittard is looking mighty around here. Let's not forget that Louis Pret has joined us in the online series that we did last year. So we have seen him racing yes, on indeed. ACC. Don't know whether he's done anything with a pit stop involved and whether Santa Locke are helping him out with that. You have to put a litre of fuel in and sometimes he may have actually come through the pit lane, stopped and gone again and may think that was enough. But if he didn't put that one litre in, it will not be registered by the server and therefore that is why he's not been registered as a pit stop. We did see it last time out that sometimes the platform didn't register those pit stops. Uh, but so it might be, a, might be a malfunction, it might be in the correct place, but ultimately uh, it's fifth position uh, in, silver, in the pro class and therefore it's no points anyway. True enough. So Louis Pret, the Monaco-based fashion retailer, the, the global head of retail for the family fashion brand, uh, he's chasing after Danny Junkadea, who uh, in a sense has got himself a little bit stuck, hasn't he? He's not really been able to do much about Crestani, who's had a really impressive drive in that Ferrari. Crestani fourth and the leading silver. Matt Campbell, by the way, despite that off, despite that what looked like really big whack against the wall, is still third. Yeah, three seconds slower his last lap than the guys around him, but that was the lap that he made contact, so that's how much time he lost. And he is, as you say, starting to close back up on Rouget and Pitta. But as long as he's third, there's still a point. Now, OK, if he starts to lose ground after that, it becomes less relevant to stay out there. But as long as he can salvage a point for the team, why not? And that is van der Linde again, I fear, off the road in the background. Yeah, I don't know if he was helped there, but that was a, a mighty accident again on the inside of uh, Blanchiment. That'll cause lots of uh, damage to that Audi and he might as well park it. A bit of a shame for Kelvin van der Linde. Yeah but he's uh, well off now and he's had that penalty, he's got the damage uh, and with only uh, 15 runners, well 14 now, yeah. It's a shame really, We've, it has been a bit of a battle of attrition and quite a lot of the cars that are parked up in the pits are the ones that have got drive-through penalties. 
Indeed. However, Arthur Rougier is still going strong. And a bit like Monza, you don't rule him out. Because remember, he led, he lost that lead to Danny Junkudea, but he never gave up. He chipped away and he clawed it back and he retook the lead. So with 14 minutes still on the clock, David Pittard is not yet out of the proverbial woods, is he? He's uh, certainly got to keep working and try and stretch that advantage. Now, nine tenths might not sound a lot, but of course, the BOP such as it is, it's not that easy to eradicate. No, absolutely. Uh, we have seen that BMW weak at certain points around the lap and stronger in certain points, and it does seem stronger in the right places, in the places where they are able to, to, to defend. Not massively fast through Double Gauche, uh, through Pouin just here, and that's where we saw the Porsche at least close up, and then into the braking zone of Fania. That was the best opportunity, but at the moment, uh, Pittard and Rougier equaling each other, 19 threes. Uh, on the last lap, uh, and uh, Matt Campbell losing a couple of tenths, but only a couple of tenths yeah. uh, to them. And not only that, Matt Campbell is still quicker than Crestani. Now, Fabrizio may have settled here for the silver win, so he doesn't have to push on for third overall necessarily. It's the class points that he's after, uh, but equally, he's not lapping quite as quickly as that rather damaged Porsche. Arthur Rougier there comes into the Cour Paul Frere, still hustling on behind David Pittard as the speed builds now as they turn right and it keeps on turning and it keeps on turning and then the road starts to gradually climb towards Blanchimont up towards the chicane at the end of the lap but Rougier tries he might he's not yet on the back of Pittard but the gap when we started talking about it at the start of the lap was nine tenths it is now just under six tenths and remember that Lamborghini is carrying 10 kilos as well and that will hurt the tyres, it will overheat the tyres quicker than uh, if he was without any success ballast uh, and it will also affect him on that climb all the way up to, to uh, Le Com. Uh, particularly as we get into the last 10 minutes of the, of the race. The tyres will have worn right down now uh, and this is where they are very, very difficult to control. Um, and although saying that, as you say, Arthur Rougier within six tenths now of Pittard and getting closer and closer, but the fastest down this part of the circuit is certainly that BMW without the weight. Indeed so, and this is exactly the ideal part of the circuit for us. And in fact, we saw yesterday in the real world at qualifying early in the evening in Q1 and Q2, that one of the outright fastest cars through this section was Carrie Moges, uh, Pro-Am BMW, and it's got all that grunt to drag it up the hill, and David Pittard using that to his advantage. So up to Lecon, keeps the lead and just as Arthur Rougier finally starts to bring the gap down they've got to turn into a corner. Yep the gap goes out to eight tenths from five and a half tenths just from the run from the start line all the way up to Le Com and up to eight tenths but this is then where the, the uh, Lamborghini is better once again through the middle part of the lap. So downhill goes Rougier then he's through the uh, speaker's corner down towards Pouin now He's still got 11 minutes in which to do this, but he's not come charging up onto the back of the BMW, has he? It's a, a tenth here, it's a few hundreds there. So he is going in the right direction, or he was, but it's tough to do. I say was because what was six tenths is now eight tenths. We're racing at kind of real time here. I was wondering whether we're going to get a, a twilight race because, of course, the ACC platform that does allow for night racing and the transition from night to day. It has weather as well, wet and dry. We've yet in our pro series to see anything other than kind of perfect conditions. It's so tricky uh, to drive this platform in the wet conditions. But night would have kind of worked out, uh, but it's only a one, uh, one hour race. In a couple of weeks time, we will have the virtual 24 hours of Spa, the 7th and 8th of August. It'll be streaming on the GT World YouTube channel. Uh, and it's for the very best in the in the virtual world, forming teams and scoring points for their virtual championship that's running alongside uh, our Pro Series this year. But you say all that, I can't remember a single drop of rain ever falling at Spa. I mean, this is archetypal Spa weather, Ben, he says, lying through his teeth. David Pittard leads up towards the end of the lap, Ben. He will come through now to put another lap in the book. 21 laps down, six tenths of a second the margin. Arthur Rougier is so close, isn't he? But he can't quite make a move. 10 minutes to go. A lap is over 2 minutes and 19 seconds at the moment. So maximum of 5 to go. Arthur Rougier now needs to start being creative in how to get past. He's even programmed his flasher button for his steering wheel here. Uh, so flashing the lights as the uh, BMW went uh, into the braking zone at Lassau to try and put David Pittard off. I don't believe that that works in sim racing. <laughs> it might put you off in the real world because you get the glare of the, from the wing, wing mirrors, but in the virtual world, it doesn't seem to have quite the same effect. But anyway, if it makes him feel better. 
absolutely. Try everything you can to find a way by, and Arthur Rougier is throwing everything at this, and the gap, depending on which sector point you look at, is either going up or coming down. Seven tenths of a second. Matt Campbell is still there in third place. His last lap was a 2 minutes 19.8, but he is now being caught a little by Fabrizio Crestani. Jean Cadea is fifth. Louis Pret is a provisional sixth, ahead of Compact, Drouet, Bourne and Tomita. And such as the uh, lack of cars on track, the gaps are pretty big, so there isn't really that much in terms of battling going on. It all looks pretty settled for Rinaldi to pick up another three points in the Silver Cup, a Mad Panda, and then Thomas Drouet in third position. So uh, two Mercedes there picking up points. 2.5, the gap between Bourne and Drouet, that perhaps could change by the end. We've got eight and a half minutes still remaining. What could change, though, is the lead, and that's what we're watching here. Indeed, so as we ride on board with David Pittard, this is the race leader's view as he slaloms his way through the piff path. The college on the right-hand side goes under the gantry, sets the car up now for the right-hander, runs it up against the kerb on the outside, grabs a gear, and David Pittard, you can see, is a study of concentration as he comes through the court pool fret, past the karting centre on the right-hand side and the speed building as he goes up, up, up through the gears into Blanchimont now, Arthur Rougier was at the last sector point half a second back, so David knows that this is not going to be an easy eight minutes, into the chicane now. He really has absorbed that pressure so mightily well in those early laps, I really didn't think he was going to be able to cope with 25 minutes remaining, but he, uh, he really has, and now there's a little bit of a gap, Rougier, there he is in the wing mirror just creeping in, that's a we, we would get a better view if we were seeing what his screen was because he'd have the wing mirrors and the big mirror uh, to be able to see exactly what's happening behind and as I said uh, the radar as well but it's not putting him off less than half a second between Pittard and Rougier but they're now on the sector of the track where he can grow that advantage so there is 87 the Mercedes in the hands of uh, Tom Adrue the Aka ASP entry and uh, that is another of the silvers it's eighth overall bear in mind as well from the silver point of view, Fabrizio Crestani uh, driving for Rinaldi. Rinaldi, admittedly with a different driver, Nicola Varone, won last time out at Paul Ricard, so as the silver team. They might be cycling different drivers through in every round, but it's still uh, still generating good results for them. David Pittard has got seven more minutes to go. He's got an advantage of half a second as Tom Drouet comes now over the timing line. Drouet chasing compact, but he's got a bit of ground to make up there. Back away as Piers taking points. Thanks to Danny Yucadella in the first two rounds, but Danny is going to miss out, isn't he, uh, on taking some points here. Uh, he nearly missed out on taking points in the last round. Remember, he got kind of caught up in a, 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 com a confusing two-part race that had a, a different set of rules, and it didn't look like he'd pitted, but he had. So when we finished our broadcast last time, actually Danny didn't get the check. Uh, and it was um, David Pittard, I think, we gave the third place to. But actually, results-wise, it ended up being Yucadella who did get those points, uh, and he's just going to miss out here. Yeah, which is strange in a sense because he's been one of the most consistent, but I think he just got caught up in the traffic early doors. Now, six minutes to go. This is the lead battle. They are almost together, aren't they? Coming now out of the piff path. David Pittard, you've got to say he's doing an outstanding job here of hanging on to that advantage. He's playing to the strengths of the BMW, but this must have felt like the longest 20-odd minutes of his life since he got the lead on the pit stops. Really strong through what was Stablo, which is now Kurt Paul Frere, on to the... Oldish, the oldest part of the circuit run through Blanchemont and back towards La Source. It didn't used to have the bus stop chicane that then was installed to slow the cars down into La Source and then changed again a lot, a, well, probably about 10 years ago now. I was about to say a couple of years ago, but it only feels like that. But uh, no opportunity there for Rougier to go down the inside. It's so close between them. Breaking zone seemed to be the issue for Pittard, but he is strong through the stronger section. So really, I think the only way that Rouge is going to make this happen is chuck it down the inside and hope there's no contact. But that's not his style, is it? He's one of the cleaner drivers. We saw that last year in the SRO series. We've seen it in these Pro Series Fan Attack back races this year. So is he going to go for broke? Is he just going to bank the points or try and force the error out of David Pittard? He's not necessarily going to, dare one say, use touring car style tactics here. And remember, there's points and prize money for the top three, and it's a decent whack of prize money. So. Uh, he doesn't want to throw away a nice big check and two teams' championship points for Emil Frey. Uh, they're looking good here. Uh, they are not going to get any silver points because Fontana's got a 15-second penalty and it's going to drop him even further back in the silver class. But, yeah, that Lamborghini just can't get close enough into the braking zone of Lecom. And I feel as though the BMW has been really well set up just to be mighty in a straight line. 
And although it's a, a mighty car, David Pittard is doing a good job as well, isn't he? He's hanging on to that advantage then. Three tenths of a second it was coming towards uh, Bruxelles and uh, down towards Speaker's Corner they come now. So the BMW just about hanging on to this advantage. Now, what have we got? Four minutes to go. There is time for two more laps at the end of this, I reckon. Let's see where we are on the clock when they break the beam. But Rougier now is almost there. Little by little, he's chipped away, chipped away, chipped away. Can he strike? Can he get that lead back? This is the place where Pittard's been the weakest, but he's found a, a, a way to be a little bit deeper on the brakes into the first part of Fania. So even though the, Arthur Rougier was really close, he wasn't quite close enough, and he's better through the last part of Fania into campers. Crawl all over the curbs on the right-hand side. All gets a bit of a swapper on, so loses the momentum. And look, that BMW starts to stretch its legs and get away. It's going to be so hard for Rougier to find a way through. Less than four minutes remaining. That's a couple of laps to go. Matt Campbell was seeing this in the distance and hoping the two of them get together, but Campbell's uh, hurting Porsche. It's no match now, and he's falling into the clutch of the Crestani, but that doesn't matter because Crestani, even if he gets past, Matt Campbell will still take that uh, one point for the Pro Cup for his team. Arthur Rougier biting his lip a little bit there as he comes down towards the bus stop. The chicane hustles it right and left up towards the line. He's got two more laps to go here as they come past the pits then. So the BMW leads the Lamborghini. It's not quite now or never for Arthur Rougier, but he is certainly running out of time. He's running out of options. David Pittard, 10th, 7th. Could it be a win for the third result? Arthur Rougier we had as the winner in that opening race back at Monza and he's the man doing the chasing here. Sixth at Paul Ricard, so again, he has always been a front runner, but the Lamborghini loses out down the hill, and again, he's gonna to struggle to make that ground up again, although Pittard gives him a helping hand by going wide, coming up Radion. He looks so cool, doesn't he? He looks so chill, just biting his lip, as you say, a little bit, a little bit of a, stru a shrug when he went through the bus stop, so he wasn't happy with how he did those particular corners, but not close enough. Half a second into Lecom this time through, and again, he'll do the same thing, try and line him up. He's been staring at this BMW for lap after lap, thinking about where he could possibly make uh, a pass, where he could intimidate Pittard into a mistake, but ultimately, Pittard has been so good under pressure. He has, and he's got a lap and a half or so of which to soak up yet more pressure. He's like a sponge, David Pittard, isn't he? Soaking all the pressure up as he comes out of Speaker's Corner now down the hill again. So Arthur Rougier will be ruining whatever happened in that pit stop to cost him not one but two places, having absolutely blitzed the field in that first stint. He's slightly tighter in the line into the first of the two left-handed elements of Pouin. And that means that he gets a good run out of the corner, down towards Piffpath, into the section of the circuit where he has been the stronger of the two. Another tight line for the first element. Pittard with a really late apex there. I'm not quite sure he was absolutely on exactly where he needed to be. Look how close Rouget is here through campus. He was, he was scruffy out of this corner last time through. He looks less scruffy this time. He's right under that massive rear wing of the BMW. Now, surely he's going to benefit from a slipstream from that car as well, but it's the braking zone into to the bus stop chicane where he needs to really get it done. Can he? Maybe he's a little bit too far back this time, but if he can tee up the move for La Source and start it here, get a good run down to the chicane, stay on the back of the BMW and maybe make the move at the first corner of the final lap of the race. He can't challenge there, but again, in a straight line, this should be where all of that grunt of the BMW carries it away by length. You've got horsepower versus aero to a degree here, that slippery shape of the Lamborghini but the grunt and go BMW that is caught under braking, but should now be able to streak away again in a straight line. Rougier is so frustrated, he knows where he is strong, he knows where the BMW is strong, and this is a strong section for the BM. And we've got traffic as well just ahead of him. I can't work out which Audi it is, but there is an Audi that they may catch uh, on the back section of the circuit. This is gonna be the last lap then. We will see the chequered flag, because it's not 60 minutes plus one lap. It is just a 60 minute encounter. Pittard to the right hand side, so almost trying to break a slipstream. But he knows this is where he's strong. He doesn't need to do that. He goes over to the left hand side, onto the curb, onto the brakes. And so that is one major overtaking opportunity cleared for Pittard to pick up the victory here at Spa. It's also an opportunity for him to try and stretch that margin to give Rougier more to do for the rest of the lap. So 0.477 of a second at the uh, last sector point there, but Pittard is wider through Brussel. He finds an apex, kind of, more or less, and hangs onto the advantage, but that was a little bit ragged, and it means the gap has come down.
Out of speaker's corner, more momentum again for Rouget in the Lamborghini. This is where Pittard was struggling to pick up the apex through Double Gouche last time through. And look at the tighter line that the Lamborghini can take. That means more momentum off the corner, but again, not quite close enough as the grunt kicks in for the BMW onto the brakes. This is again where the Lamborghini is really strong. The clock has gone down to zero. We will see the chequered flag this time through and less and less corners means less and less opportunities for Rouget. David Pittard can be as slow as he likes in a way through here, stack up the Lamborghini and then use all of the horsepower. Now, unleash it, coming out of the uh, Cour Paul Frere. So this is where the BMW should be able to get away, but Rouget is not letting him. He has got his foot absolutely through the floor of his sim rig, and he's right there on the back of the BMW. This is Blanchimont, there's one more corner to go, up towards the bus stop. It's going to be the closest finish yet in our uh, Fanatec GT Esports Pro Series. Nose to tail, Rouget thinks about one side. He looks on the outside line, they're going to be dead set, level into the corner, but David Pittard is ahead, Rouget sideways, he hangs on to it, but David Pittard has done enough. It's going to be a win for the BMW. David Pittard wins at Spa. There he is, punching <laughs> the air. <laughs> I love that. Well done, David. What a drive. What a race. What a race. Arthur Rougier second, and he threw Ben everything at that at the last corner. Yeah, absolutely. He made some attempt to go around the outside, but it was always going to be very, very tricky, especially Pittard knew what he was doing, was able to run him wide on the exit as well. And I'd love to see the driver's emotions and Pittard really showing that he's worked hard for this. You can see the BMW boys in the background coming to congratulate him as well. Great to have BMW here to kind of cheer him on and get the victory for the first time for BMW. And well done to the boy Nils Naujok, so back at home, who's been helping Pittard out as well. For the Silver Cup then, we've got Cristani for Rinaldi taking the full point. Second, Compaq, and third, Drouet. So plenty of drama all the way through. It's a shame again, and we say it every time that we have the contact. Now, Louis Pratt has been given a 130-second penalty, so I suspect that uh, he definitely did not do a pit stop. But anyway, uh, we'll let the stewards unravel all of that. David Pittard is a delighted race winner. Well done, David. Playing to the gallery there down at uh, the foot of Radion, but a brilliant race and two completely different segments. Domination by Arthur Rouget in the first and a brilliant cat and mouse battle in the second. Yeah, he definitely didn't have the pace in the second to clear off, did he? But why, the question being, why did Rouget lose all that time? Read the press release and you'll find out. Here is the result. <laughs> David Pittard is the race winner from Arthur Rouget second and Matt Campbell takes third ahead of Fabrizio Cristani as the silver winner in fourth. Fifth, Danny Juncadea ahead of Louis Pret. Then seventh, Ezequiel Perez Compank. Eighth, Tom Adrue. Ninth, Nicholas Bourne. And Raichi Tomita, Raichiri Tomita rather, takes tenth position. So some fantastic racing all the way through to the end of what, for my money, has been the best of our three races thus far. Brilliant stuff from start to finish. And we will have more of the same in a month's time at the Nürburgring. David Pittard photographing the screen that's showing him, photographing him, photographing him, photographing him. <laughs> and uh, also the result page as well, which shows very proudly David Pittard at the uh, top. And uh, You can see how much he's worked as well. I was just going to say that. For some of us just sat down for an hour, it looks quite hot and bothered. <laughs> well done, David. Great job. David Pittard wins the third round of the Fanatec Esports GT Pro Series. And that was a mega drive. So we'll have the podium very shortly. First, let's just catch our breath here at Spa at the end of a great race. The best GT racers in the world. I've been lucky enough to have done the four biggest 24 races in my life. Le Mans, Nürburgring, Daytona and Spa. And I'm not saying this because I'm racing in this category, but Spa is definitely the hardest one. It's a lottery. You have to hope that it's your year. Thousand percent motivated and want to win this every year. What am I doing? Some of the guys in the silver cars, I mean, they could be my children, right, from an age point of view. To start in spite really difficult, but it's a good pressure, I like it. We go racing, Raffaele Marchiello, he's in the lead, but is he going to hang on to it? Yes, he is! As 56 GT3 car, power uphill, through a rouge for the first time. Of course, being the only pro McLaren in the championship, that does carry pressure. We're expected by each and every individual back at the factory to deliver on their behalf. 
you look back to the history BMW has here, I mean, that's great and you want to be part of that history. It's my first 24 hour race, not sure what to expect. Some of the big unknowns are physically how I'm going to hold up over 24 hours. It's the biggest race of the year, especially for a Belgian driver. This year I'm driving his uh, Belgian legend who won the race already twice, uh, which is Lorenz Van Toe. Two Belgians, one from the Flemish part, one from the French part. There's always naturally this, this rivalry between us. For a 24 hour spa in Belgium, it's a great thing. You win it the first time, the second time, or maybe I will have the chance to win it a third time in my life. It will never change. The relief if you cross the line as a winner is it's just an amazing feeling. And I think this is like, yeah, like winning a championship. Here on it, the line starts to go pretty quickly. Joining us here in the arena for what was an incredibly entertaining uh, 60 minutes here of Spa. We've got 24 hours to go, of course, across the weekend. But let's get our podium for this virtual race uh, underway then. We're going to start with the silver category. Uh, so please welcome in third position for British uh, third position, sorry, Thomas Drouet from Aka ASP. Onto the podium, please, Thomas. There he is. Third position. Third over there. How many podiums have been on? <laughs> Second for Mad Panda Motorsport as we'll compact. <laughs> I hope you can see. Oh, look at the socks as well. Fantastic. That dot there. There we go. And your winner, the third different winner for Rinaldi Racing, Fabrizio Cristani. Congratulations, let's uh, just quickly, uh, actually we'll do the presentation and then I'll do an interview. Uh, so to, to make the presentation then, it'll be Valerio Persanti, which is the VP of Licensing and Partnerships at Kunos, and presenting the trophy for third position to Thomas Drew. <laughs> Valerio will also present the trophy for second position to Esquil Compact from Mad Panda. And Valerio Persanti, the VP of Licensing and Partnership at Kunos, will present the winner's trophy to Fabrizio Cristani for Rinaldi Racing. Of course, we also have the Czechs, and a huge thanks to Fanatec uh, for presenting those three Czechs. Let's get a quick photo from those of you that need photos. There we go. Okay, thank you for first and second. Let's get a quick word before Fabrizio j disappears. Uh, Fabrizio, uh, your first time in our arena. How have you enjoyed it? Uh, it was great fun. Really, really great fun. And uh, I'm really happy with the results. Uh, the team was uh, good in the previous races. So I had uh, a lot of ballast, 65 kilos, the most penalized car on the grid. So uh, yeah, I was hoping to be on the podium and uh, winning, it's, uh, it's great. Do I see a little bit of sweat on your forehead? Yeah, yeah, I mean, you have to push, man. Everybody's pushing behind, so yeah. Congratulations, thank you very much. The winner of the silver category for Rinaldi Racing, and they've got some decent championship points out of their virtual racing. Uh, for the real world. Right, we'll move on to the overall podium, which is for our pro category. Please welcome onto the podium in third position after a mega battle, these top three, Matt Campbell for GPX. In second position for Emil Frey, Arthur Rouget. And your winner for BMW Vulcan Horse Motorsport, David Pittard. I think David enjoyed winning that one. Please welcome now to the podium the boss and CEO of Fanatec and the man that makes us all happen, Thomas Yakamaya, to present the trophies. To firstly, third position, Matt Campbell.
Thomas will present the trophy to our second position driver today, Arthur Rougier. And the winner's trophy for the first time to David Pittard. Huge amount of work going in the background and also for these drivers here in this arena as they were testing. Here are the checks, thanks to Fanatec, uh, for their efforts today. And of course, three teams championship points going to Vulcan Horse Motorsport, two to ML Frey and one to GPX. It really has been a great race between these three. Respectful racing, entertaining racing. And I hope you guys here uh, online and in the arena enjoyed it. Right, David, let's have a quick word with you before we go off air. Um, unbelievably absorbing pressure for about half of that race. It was awesome. I mean, after the first couple of laps, I was thinking, oh, I might be a bit dull here with Arthur going up the road. I mean, he's been so quick all year. Uh, and Matt's just nipping past me. Uh, but yeah, we nailed the pit stops. And yeah, in an in a, uh, endurance race with a stop, you've got to make sure you nail absolutely everything. And we did that uh, and bought it home. So yeah, the BMW has always run well at Spa. Um, in the in reality, but now virtually as well. Just how hard was it absorbing Matt's pressure and Arthur as well? Uh, to be fair, when we came out of the pits, I saw that they were very close between each other. So uh, Matt, in particular, had to sort of have eyes in the back of his head, particularly. So I knew that if I could survive the middle sector, uh, the strong sectors for sector uh, for the BMW are sector one and three, um, I could I could uh, hold on to the lead. The outlap was tricky because the tyres were cold, but yeah, I, I, stuck, I kept my elbows out, kept them behind, and then, um, yeah, Arthur made me sweat right there on the last lap. Um, yeah, I hope it's as close this weekend for the real-life race as it was today. Absolutely. Get your head down and focus on the real world. Thank you very much, uh, David Pittard, your winner here. And you can see how much it means to David, both in the sim and on the stage here, punching the air with joy and representing Valkenhorst and BMW. And we've got BMW Valkenhorst here as well to celebrate that victory and that check. Uh, and so now we turn our attention uh, to the real world, to the 24 hours of Spa that will be taking part, or will be taking place uh, tomorrow afternoon. Uh, but before that, we will have Super Pole this evening right here on the GT World YouTube channel. And of course, the next sim event will be in a couple of weeks' time at the Nürburgring at the start of September. Make sure you join us there. Thank you very much for joining us, and we'll see you again. Bye-bye.